Genesis 14. Are you there? Okay, let's go to Genesis 14. Uh, pick us up from verse 17 and we go all the way to the end of, end of scripture. Are you there? On the count of three, one, two, three, read. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Come on, let's go, Man Zion. That is the king's valley. Uh huh. After his return from the defeat of Kidaloma and the kings who were with him. Verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of S yes, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Verse 22, but Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. Very good. That I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is, come on, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich, Micaiah, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, uh -huh, that name, Eshko, Mamre, let them take their portion. Are you there? Let's go quickly to verse to chapter 15. Chapter 15. Are you there? Okay, let's start from verse 1 for the, for the sake of continuity. After these things, uh-huh, one, two, three, go. Uh-huh. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not be afraid. I am your shield and your exceedingly... Ooh, I'm getting too excited here. But Abraham said, Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, everybody... Yes, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Verse 5, we're ending with 6. Verse 5. Yes. Yes. If you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And he believed in the Lord and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Amen. I want to share for a few minutes, God helping me, using as a title, the rich plan of grace for your life. The rich plan of grace for your life. Amen. Please tell your neighbor, tell them God has got a plan for my life. I, I can see that one doesn't believe it. Tell the other neighbor, there, tell them God has a plan for my life. I don't care what you think about me, but God has a plan for my life. Amen. Please be seated in God's good house. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Uh, let's see if we can. Uh, I, I have no intention, but let's see if we can. Uh, you know the story when we go into Genesis chapter 14. The Bible says he had come from defeating the kings. And uh, Abraham had used his own servants, born in his own house, trained to go and fight. I, I believe there were four or five kings and he defeated them. And these were the kings that had attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and taken away all the people, all the goods and all the loot and all the possession and the spoils of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot was one of the people that was taken. So when Abraham went to fight, to fight the kings, he went to fight not just because he was interested in defending, but he had interest because Lot 
his uh, nephew was part of the people that had been taken. So we pick up the story where now he has won the battle. He has rescued what was stolen and he's going back. And now the king of Sodom, who his name was Kidiloma, uh, meets him and says to him, look, thank you for rescuing. Thank you for doing this. We understand that you are the one that did the hard work. You're the one that went to war. You're the one that fought the battle. You're the one that did this. So you have earned the right to keep the goods. But please give to us our wives, give to us all the people that were, if you like, kidnapped or that were taken as slaves or prisoners of war, if you like. Just give us the people and we're going to start again. And the Bible says, Abraham said to the king, he says, I'll not only give you your people, I'll give you everything that I rescued that was yours, cattle, camels, everything. He says, I do not want you in future to claim that it is because of your riches, your wealth, that you have made Abraham reach are you all right i love 23 he says and i'll take nothing from the thread or sandal that you not take anything that is yours lest you should say uh-huh okay some of you are still not catching up so i'll start preaching from there may god bless you that no one claims they were responsible for your breakthrough your riches or your elevation amen May God be the one that is responsible for what he will do in your life. That men will not be able to take credit for the blessing of God in your life. Amen. And sometimes God will remove certain individuals in your life so that they do not steal the glory of God for the things that God is doing. He will take the blesser away. So that God can be your real blesser. Amen. Yes, yes. God will move and shift around some things in your life. So that when it comes to the season of your blessing, there is no one that can take the credit that it was them that were responsible for your elevation, for your progress, for your blessing. Are you all right? That it is God and God alone that would take the credit. And Abraham said, I know that this God is capable of blessing me. So there's no need for me to try and rush and get all of this. Thank you, Joshua. There's no need for me to rush and get this. This God will do it for me. Tell me, tell your neighbor, this God will do it for you. Help me tell the other neighbor, this God will do it for you. Amen. So as we begin, let me make my first point. And my first point, we are looking and we are in a series called There's Grace on This Mountain. Listen to me, beloved. Grace is not a passport for laziness. So can we start from there quickly? That, that just because God has promised our lives to be lives of grace and we have, he has positioned us in places of grace does not mean that we must live in laziness. Are you all right? That the grace of God simply means that God has accomplished for us what our labor cannot accomplish on our behalf. Are you okay, somebody? You, you, you cannot pay for your sins. The grace of God is responsible for your salvation and your righteousness. Can I get an amen? Yes, yeah, so that it is possible that in spite of you and in spite of all your you know, mistakes, I won't say the word that I really want to say. We just call them your mistakes. In spite of everything that you and I are, God in his grace and mercy has found it uh, befitting for us to take a position of righteousness that we do not deserve. It is but by the grace of God. Are you all right? So just because we have been promised a life of grace, that does not mean that we have received a passport for laziness. Amen. So let me explain this in two or three minutes so that we can move on. Uh, if, for example, salvation required that you die... Because there is no forgiveness of sin without the, are you right? Without the shedding of blood. So if you were going to get your sins forgiven, what you needed to do uh, in the Old Testament is kill your uh, sheep, your oxen, your all of those things, sacrifice it, and then you'd have a temporary permit of righteousness, if you like. It was not permanent. It was there to take sin. It was there to atone just temporarily. Today, Christ has died once that there's no need for us to be going to church. You know, we would have been in business as pastors, asking everybody to bring a sheep, a lamb. You know, it would have acted like as if, you know, in, 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 what do you call that thing you pay before you get married? Lobo, hey, it would be, you come to church with, say, hey, you, your sins were too many. Big cow. You, your sins, okay, they were small, small sheep. Are you, we'll be making money in church. God help us. Amen. But Christ has paid our sins once and for all. There is no need for you to begin to share, to begin to prepare your own lamb. You begin to orchestrate your own salvation 
by his grace, Christ died. And by believing in him, we receive the forgiveness of sin. Are you here? However, just because we receive it by grace does not mean you will be, if you like, uh, positioned in a place of stupor and allow everything to happen without your participation. Uh, the Bible says, John chapter 3 verse 16, everybody, one, two, three, go. For God, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should not but have very good. So, although Christ died for the whole world, are you there? That's what your Bible says. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes. So, this one sacrifice is for the whole world. Yet, there are people who will still go to hell because they have not received the gift of grace. Amen. So, it is still a gift of grace. You don't have to do anything, but you need to receive it. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you qualify for it. Are you okay? So let me explain another example of grace. If I wanted to buy you the latest, what's the best car? Let's say, what's the car that we can use? G-Wagon. Someone says G-Wagon. Let's use G-Wagon. Uh, if, if, if you were promised a G-Wagon, the price of that brand new car, 2022 model, would be in the millions. Are you all right? So, then someone says, look, I will gift you, I will what? Gift you with this car. But all I ask for you to do is mow my grass. Are you alright? Mow my grass. It's not even an, an acre of grass. You cannot now mow the grass and say, I qualified and end the G-Wagon. No, because the labor cost of mowing grass for less than an acre is not equivalent to the price of a G-Wagon. So, although you've done that, whatever you have done is not equivalent to what you're receiving. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. So, when we come to the place of receiving the gifts of God that are of grace, we understand that they are of grace. But that does not mean that they come without our engagement or participation. However, our participation cannot record as a price befitting for what we receive. Are you all right? So that even if you prayed, even if you fasted, even if you stood in faith, whatever you did is not befitting to what you receive. Because what you receive is far above the price you paid. There may be a price seemingly that you pay, but you cannot call that a price because it is insignificant compared to the gift of grace that God is giving you. Are you here, somebody? So therefore, you come to God with the heart of engagement and participation, but you understand that your participation is not what has earned you the right to the gift of God. The gift of God is at a higher price that even if you looked at your own righteousness, your righteousness is as filthy rags. Yet, you still must engage at a place of participation and engagement. Are you alright? So that we might even say you must still learn, you must still uh, learn, yeah. More, you must still mow the grass. Are you mow the lawn? But even if you are mowing the lawn, the jiwagon is by grace of God, because you cannot compare your. If we hired someone on a professional basis and paid them maybe na five hundred C figure, are you alright? So we are saying you are not necessarily earning it. It is your participation and engagement in what God has prepared for you. Are you okay? So we understand therefore that although God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, we have a role to play. But the role we play is not a role that seemingly is equivalent compared to the grace or the gifts of grace that we receive. So far, so good. Point number one. Point number two is this, beloved. And I hope you can catch this one. That in this life, there are things you can get by labor and there are things you can get by grace. Are you okay? Some people say it this way. There are things you will get by labor and there are things you will get by favor. Are you all right? Because grace is unmerited favor. Are you all right? So, 
we find here an Abram before he was Abraham who went to a war. In fact, take me to Genesis 14 so that people can appreciate what happened. Genesis 14, let's try and see if we can pick a few things from there. Genesis 14, are you there? Yeah, I know you're taking me to verse 17. But let's start from all the way to um, the top. Uh, verse 4, please. Verse 4 for the sake of time. It says, 12 years they served Kedolom and the... Okay, 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 okay. Uh, 14, 14, 11. They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their provisions and went their way. Are you there? All right. Uh, go to 12. They also took Lot, Abraham's son, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. And, and then one who had escaped came and told Abraham, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mam and Amorite, the brother of Eshko, and the brother of Anna, and they were allies of Abraham. Now when Abraham heard that his brother's son was taken captive, he did what? Are you there? He armed his 308, uh, hearth. he armed his 318 trained servants who were what? Born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, whatever Abraham is now, when we read, we come to verse 17, we find that this is what Abraham's labor can do for him. Okay, let's read this because you can... Let's, uh, take me back to 15. You were in 14. Take me to 15 so everybody can see. He divided his forces uh -huh, against them by what? He and his servants did what? Attacked them and pursued them as far as what? Which is in the north of... You are a good class. Uh -huh. Verse 16. He brought back all the goods and he brought back his brother Lord and... And as well as the women, verse 17 is where we will take us to verse 17. And the king of Sodom now did, does what? All right. Now, go back to verse 14. Verse 14. Now, Abraham took, uh, when Abraham heard his brother was taken captive, he did what? He armed how many? 300. Now, what is to arm? To arm is to equip. Amen. Let me say it another way. So, although they were trained, they could not go to war until they were armed. Now, you don't have to be a, a, a military man or person to understand what this means. It means that they were given necessary weaponry for them to fight this battle. Are you okay? Are you all right? So, they were given the necessary things for them to fight the battle. Are you all right? So, if they were armed, they went into the battle, not chabe manja manja. Please help me, English people. They went into battle with the confidence that they had the right weaponry to engage in this fight. Some people still haven't heard what I'm talking about. Uh, there are some of us in this room, and, and, and we thank God for this, that your parents armed you. Yeah, yeah, they armed you. They made sure that the school you went to was right. So they armed you. They made sure that you went to the right college. Their role was to arm you. They made sure that not only did you go to the right college, but even when it was time for you to get a job, they called their connections because anyone can get a job, but they made sure that you got a job in the right places. Their intent, their vision, their purpose, their, their heart for you was so that as you were armed, you can go through life and be victorious beyond what other people may be, may gain out of life. So in their wisdom, in their heart for you, they did their best not only to equip you, but to position you for success. I, are you here, somebody? And because you were positioned by, for success, you were positioned by labor, you were positioned by equipping, you were positioned by weaponry that you are using to ply and leverage yourself in the marketplace and in society so that it seemingly you can have a better life or a more comfortable life probably than the ones that they themselves had. Amen. Shaga Yelebo Jaya. Are you okay? And there is nothing wrong with that the only problem i have is this 
that in God's plan for your life, not even your parents planned at the level of your father God. While I appreciate the education your parents gave you, I am here to submit to you that when it comes to the plan of God for your life, it supersedes the plan of your parents. While I appreciate the wisdom and the connections and all that they did in sacrificing to help you become the person you are either becoming or have already become, I am here to tell you that the plan of those that helped you from a human perspective cannot equate to the plan of grace of God for your life. I am here to submit, beloved, as ridiculous as it may sound, that there is a plan of God for your life and it is a plan of grace. That there is a plan of God that may take recognition of what it is that you've done through labor. But there is a plan that goes beyond labor and it is a plan of favor. It is a plan of grace. It is a plan that is above and superior to the plan of the flesh. It is superior to the plan of you coming together and putting together 318 trained in order to have victory. Thank you for the victory, but there is a greater plan than that. Those that do not realize that there is a greater plan than that, the moment they meet Kedoloma, they begin to say, this is mine. The keto, the keto is mine. The donkey is mine. The camel is mine. The gods are mine. You can take this one. They begin to fight what they think they have earned in life. They do not know that there is a superior plan of God that makes these things look so insignificant today. I'm just preaching to somebody here. That instead of fighting for what it is that you've been fighting for, if God can give you an encounter, you will begin to see that there's a superior plan. Are you here, somebody? How does this plan begin? I'm glad you asked, even if you didn't. This plan begins by recognizing or by having a revelation of who Jesus is in your life. All right, let's work it, Lord. Uh, those of you that have read the Bible, you will discover that no one gets saved except through Jesus Christ. Amen. I know I have caused confusion. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the except through me. Are you there? The question, therefore, what happened to people who lived without Jesus? What happens to people who lived, if you like, even before Jesus? Amen. Hello. How can they go to the Father through Jesus? Jesus was not there. I submit to you again that no one can see the Father except through Jesus Christ. Amen. No one, and I mean no one. Uh, not Abraham. Not Adam. Not Noah. Are you all right? Not Joseph, not Jacob, none of them will see the Father except they go through Jesus. It therefore brings us at a dilemma. The dilemma is Jesus is born of a virgin called Mary years after Abraham. So how does Abraham make it if the way to the Father is through Jesus? When Jesus is a descendant, biologically speaking, of Abraham, you caught it. How does David make it to the Father? When David is the great 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 grandfather of Jesus, no one can see the Father except through Jesus says, I am the the and the and no one can come to the Father except they come through. Beloved, I'm here to submit to you that even though Jesus was born through Mary, Jesus manifested before Mary. And that those that were beneficiaries of grace are those that were able to perceive Jesus in men. Let's see if we can work this for a few minutes. Uh, take me to Matthew chapter 10, I think. God help me. Matthew chapter 10. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, are you there? Let's see, hopefully we can get there. Matthew chapter 10. If I make a mistake, the Lord will help me. Verse 40. Here's a, ooh, this is exciting. Everybody, are you ready? 
One, two, three, read. He who receives you, uh -huh. receives him who? Jesus is Lord. Verse 41. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive. Uh huh. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive. Very good. Next verse. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a. Assuredly, I say to you, have his reward. Amen. Now, of course, my interest is the first part, but let me just, you know, because I'm already here, let me just help you with that. There are three levels of honor. Amen. God will test you on three levels. First level, God will test you for those who are higher than you. He who receives a prophet. Are you already there? Then is, the next level is he who receives a righteous man. Righteous man, anyone can be a righteous man, including yourself. So it means that one is at your level. Then he who receives a little one, those that are lower than you. The secret is, can you perceive Christ in the prophet? Can you perceive Christ in the righteous man? Can you perceive? <laughs> Do you remember what Jesus said? He says, away from me. I was hungry. Uh-huh. I was sick. You remember, I was in prison. You remember that? I was naked. And they asked him, Lord, when were you sick naked? He says, whatever you did to these little ones, you did. Now, you are, now you're understanding. So what we are trying to say tonight is simply this. That God has used men and it is descending of Christ in men that gives you access to grace. Amen. You've caught it. Because if you are able to see a prophet... It's not the prophet you see. Bible tells us, uh, you can start me from 40 uh, there. It says, whoever receives anyone, 40 please. Whoever receives me, receives, whoever receives you, receives who? So in other words, when God or when Jesus was sending his disciples, he, his goal was that the people must see Jesus in the disciples. Amen. Uh, the problem with us is that when we see, which I, I can't boys fear, I can't boys we are not able to discern the Jesus in the Camboys. And we disqualify ourselves from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That says if you will receive him and give him a cup of cold water, you will receive the reward of the prophet. Are you alright? So the secret is having the discernment to seeing Christ in men. Having the ability to discern Jesus in ordinary men. That when you are blessing someone looking less fortunate, it's not someone less fortunate. It's Christ in the man. And that you are moved by discernment that whatsoever you do is not for men, but it's for God, although doing it through men. Now, why am I saying that? When you read now, you can take me back to Genesis 14. Oh, my job is done. My job is done. Take, take us back to Genesis 14. When you read, you begin to realize, uh, take me to uh, verse, I think it's 18. Try 18. If it's not, we'll still search. Uh -huh. um, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out what? Bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. Uh -huh. Next verse. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of Heaven and earth. Next, uh, if I had time, we'll teach that. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And what did Abraham do? Uh, rewind. And what did Abraham do? Why does your volume go low when you start reading on tithe, eh? <laughs> you were okay all this time. Now we are talking about uh, your mama, mama, mama. It's in your Bible. It's not me. And he gave him a tithe. Ayala bakaya. Are you okay, somebody? Please notice with me that Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe. A tithe is given to a priest. According to scripture, it teaches us that you must bring the tithe to the storehouse, which is the last revelation of Malachi concerning tithe, that you must bring it to the storehouse that there may be meat. But here is Abraham who is setting the temple on tithing because before this, we have never seen a man tithe. 
So the first mention of tithe, Abraham takes tithe and gives it to a man who is a priest and is a royal priest. Are you there? Because the Bible says he's the priest after, he's the priest of, uh, take me back to this, uh, take me one, one verse back. Yes, the, what, 17, not 17, 18. Yes, and Melchizedek was what? Now, the Bible says Melchizedek was number one king of Salem, but number two, it says he was a priest. Now, in the Old Testament, very few, in fact, there was nobody that occupied those two offices at the same time. If you were anointed, you were anointed king, or you were anointed prophet, or you were anointed priest. However, we here we find a man by the name of Melchizedek, who is a king of Salem. Salem means peace. He's a king of peace. And number two, he's a priest. This is a characteristic that is only found in Jesus. There's never been anybody in scripture, in history, who was both king and priest at the same time except Jesus. Number two, he is the king of Salem, meaning Salem is the interpreter. The meaning of Salem is priest. The only king of peace or the prince of peace as we call him now is Jesus. So when Abraham is meeting Melchizedek, he has a revelation that although this is a man, this is Christ. And he fulfills the principle of discerning Jesus in men. Therefore, he has access to the Father because he has descended Jesus in a man. I, you're okay. I submit to you that everyone, including Noah, of the old, encountered Jesus by revelation. And that's how they were saved. Let me give you one easy one that you will know. Remember the four Hebrew boys walking in a fire? Amen. When they were thrown in a fire, they were walking. He says, and then there appeared a, a fourth man. And he appeared to be like the son of God. Here is Jesus who was showing up at countless seasons and times in the Old Testament before the womb of Mary was ready. So that man can have access to the father even before he was born. Are you okay, somebody? So at each point... In people's lives, and if we had a way we would be able to explain, if we had time, I would be able to tell you how Jesus appeared to all of the patriarchs, all the way to the prophets. And we will show you his, this was Jesus. Melchizedek was Jesus. The ark that Noah built was Jesus. We could go on and show you one principle after another to see and discern Jesus. And the ones that got saved were the ones that saw God beyond the physical elements of men. The ones that were not treating Melchizedek. The ones that were able to see beyond that this is not an ordinary man or ordinary moment. They were able to discern the Jesus in a man. Those accessed grace. So in case you have not caught what we are saying, let's summarize it. There's a Jesus in the prophet. May God give you the discernment. There's a Jesus in your neighbor. If you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, if you're able to discern the Jesus in your neighbor, you have discerned Christ. If you're able to discern in the little ones, you've discerned Christ. But much more, there's a Jesus on the inside of you. Are you here, somebody? And that in all that we do, and all the things that we probably, are as rituals, as things we do, our goal is to constantly gain a revelation of who Jesus is in our lives. It is those places that made the old patriarchs begin and began, begin to develop names like Jehovah Jireh. Because as they were doing, they realized, wait a minute, this is not ordinary. There's Jehovah Jireh in this thing. As they were continuing, they says Jehovah El Shaddai. There's El Shaddai in this thing. There's Jehovah Elohim. And they began to descend out of ordinary circumstances. They began to see and God was revealed to them. Amen. Let's see if we can close now. The number of labor is represented by your hands. Are you there? Let's go to uh, Psalm chapter 1. Let's see if I can work this for a few minutes. Psalm chapter 1. Are you there? Help me tell your neighbor, God has a plan for my life. Help me tell the other neighbor, God has a plan for my life. Everybody on the count of three. One, this scripture, in fact, we should not even put it on the screen. If you're a member of this church, you should know this scripture by heart, memorized word for word. Amen. And, and only versions allowed, New King James, King James, NIV, NLT, I, not these funny versions, good versions. Amen. 
you, uh, hey, you should know this one word for word. In fact, I'm tempted to say, let's just shut the screen and then you will recite to me because you people, you are powerful in scripture like that. Amen. No, you are powerful like that. This scripture, you must know word for word. I wish I was doing days of rain right now. Make you stand and close the thing and say, stand, begin from the top. Are you here, somebody? You must memorize Psalm 1, all of it, word for word. For the sake of those that are visiting for the first time and those watching online, <laughs> let's put it on the screen because they might think we are evil. We are, we are, we are nice. Everybody in the count of three. One, two, three, read. The Bible says, blessed is the man who walks not in the council. Yes, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he does what? Meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season. Whose leaf shall not wither. Yes. And whatever he does. Alabakaya. Next line. The ungodly are not like this, not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. <laughs> Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly. Take me three verses backwards. I think it's verse four, if I'm not mistaken. Verse four. Uh, verse three. Yes. Everybody, one more time. One, two, three, read. Yes. Whatever he does shall what? Whatever he does shall what? I need you to understand that what happened in the garden when man sinned is that for man to supply his family, he needed to labor. He needed to work with his hands. Are you okay? He needed to work with his hands in order to supply his family, in order to supply himself. The Bible there tells us in verse 3 that whatsoever he does shall what? And the, you guys like to quote this. God shall bless the works of my... All right, let's see if we can work this for a few minutes. Your hands are therefore the instruments of your work. That what you do with your hands is what amounts. Of course, it is a product of your imagination, brain, calculation, imagination, and everything. But the real instrument of your labor are your hands. Uh -huh. That's why some of you sit on a laptop and you type. Uh -huh. If you are a contractor, you work with your hands. Your hands are therefore the instruments of your labor. Let me say it in another way. When God was blessing you with your anatomy, the instruments he gave you for your labor are your hands. That you will work with your hands and provide for yourself and your family. Whether that work, especially in Bible times, involved farming, which meant tilling the ground, using your hands. You might get a hoe, you might use another instrument, but the primary instrument for your labor is your hands. Are you all right? There are people, and please, I'm not saying this to, to make anybody feel bad, but it is truth. Whose hands need deliverance? No, I, I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad. It's just uh, real stuff. We need to talk about it. There are people's hands that need deliverance. What do I mean? There are certain people that when you put something in their hands, it begins to die. That you take the same thing and put it in another person's hands, it begins to leave. And you begin to realize that there is a power that is working beyond the forces of the hands that causes either things to live or die based on where you are. Uh, that uh, Esau will ask his sons, go and bring me an animal. One will go and labor to kill a wild animal to come and cook so he can get a blessing. One will go behind the house and cook what was behind the house. And Isaac will not tell whether it's game meat or goat meat. Are you here, somebody? Now, they both brought meat to Isaac, looking for a blessing. But one got it by labor. The other got it by grace. Are you here, somebody? And if you read that story, you realize that when Isaac discovered that he had made a mistake, he did not reverse the blessing. Because the blessing is not in labor. The blessing is in grace. 
the one who went and got by grace what one went to get by labor secured the blessing of God. Even when the man who made the pronunciation and declaration realized he made a mistake. Because it was not a mistake when there is grace. Ah, Jesus, help me tonight. Other people would have said he stole the blessing. If he stole, why didn't the person who was the owner get it back? It was God trying to demonstrate that his plan for our lives is not based on labor. And labor is good, but it is based on his favor. That whatever the labor can produce for you, favor can do better than your labor. And I came tonight to announce to somebody that God has a plan of grace, a plan of favor for your life that is better than your plan of labor. And if we do our job right tonight, I pray your journey will begin to begin to migrate, to begin to move from the place of just being a person of labor to a person who is a beneficiary of the grace of God operating in your life. That the things that you will begin to enjoy are not only the products of your labor, but you will begin to enjoy the products of God's favor and grace over your life. Let me tell your neighbor, God has a plan for my life. Help me tell the other person, God has a plan for my life. And if you really believe it tonight, I pray that God will bring you into a place where that plan will begin to manifest. Let's see if we can see and work this thing a little bit. Allow me to bring a witness to the stand by the name of Pharaoh. I bring Pharaoh to the stand so that we can question Pharaoh as to how he treated the Israelites. The Bible says when Pharaoh saw that the Israelites, while they were living in Egypt, were multiplying, he thought to reduce their multiplication, he must increase their labor. And he gave the command that now they should make bricks without straw. In other words, increase the, cap increase the hardship of making what they needed in order to produce the same result. So the plan of Pharaoh was to ensure that if a person was a Hebrew, let him produce the same amount of bricks, but now at a higher cost, at a greater demand of labor, because there was no more straw supplied, no, they, they, they did not give them all the materials that they needed. Why? So that now you have to use more force to produce the same result. This is not for everybody, but just for a few people. Have you ever come to the place or are you in a place where you're beginning to feel that to do the same thing you used to do, now you have to work extra hard yet to produce the same result? It is a system of Pharaoh. It is a system of the enemy over your life trying to trap you into the place of labor and disqualify you from the place of God's favor. To come to the place where you believe that you have to apply yourself more than you have applied yourself before, but only to produce similar results. Now, if you were applying yourself double, you should get double results. But here is Pharaoh saying to them, you will work harder, but I want the same result. So he's looking for increase in labor, but same result. Which businessman, what kind of thinking is this? That you will make your workers work longer hours only to produce same amount of product. When they could have worked for fewer hours and still produce. Ah, yeah, now we are in business. Understand, beloved, that when God calls Moses and says to Moses, I have come down, I'm in, I'm in Exodus chapter, uh, is it 5, 3, 3, 5? 3, 5. He says, I have come down because I've heard the cry of my people. I've come to deliver them. Are you all right? He says, I've come to do what? Now Moses begins to speak English and grammar to God. How can I? I am this. I can't speak. I can't do. How will Pharaoh is speaking English? Why am I saying he's speaking English? Listen to me. If God says, I'm sending you to go and bring them out, and it is God speaking, it means at that point, it does not matter your disqualification. It does not matter your qualification. It does not matter how equipped or ill-equipped you are, like Abraham's servant, you are going to do this not by labor. Let's see if we can work it. Take me to Exodus so people can see what we're talking about just there. Exodus chapter 3, 5. I think it's 3, 5. Uh, then he said, uh, yes, draw near to me and take off your sandals. Next verse. 
He says, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses did what? He did his face. Next verse. Uh, I don't have time for all of it. I have seen, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are where? And I've heard their cry because of their tax masters, for I know their sorrows. This is God sending Moses. And if you go on to read even up to chapter 4, Moses begins to speak English to God. Whatever English he was speaking, whether it is Hebrew, but Hebrew English. To try and give God the reason that God has made a mistake. Are you ready? He tells God, I can't speak. He tells God, he tells God, they will not believe me. He tells God, all, he gives God all kinds of reasons why he is not the right person for the job. Why? Because Moses is looking at labor and not looking at grace. So the first thing God says to him to convince Moses that he's able to do it is God asks Moses that powerful question, which is, what is that in your hand? You'll find that in chapter 4. And God asked Moses, what is that in your hand? Why? Because according to Moses, what was in his hand was labor. <laughs> and so the Lord asked him, Exodus chapter 4 verse 2. And so the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? And he answered the word, a product of my labor. And God says to him, verse 3. <laughs> and he said to him, cast it to the and so he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from his own road. Why? Because God was now demonstrating that I am the God that has got the capacity to turn your labor into favor. Let me talk to somebody here. Listen to me. God is simply asking you, what is that that is in your hand? If you keep it in your hand, it is a product of your labor. But if you cast it before God, it becomes a product of your favor. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. There has to be migration tonight. There has to be movement tonight. That somebody needs to change spiritual addresses from the place of hard labor to the place of greater grace in Jesus' name. Somebody under the sound of my voice, I am praying that you will experience a movement, a shifting. The, yes, yes. May God transfer you from where you have been living and plant you into Grace Avenue from Labor Street or Road. Hi, are you okay? And he asks him and says, what is that that is in your hand? And Moses answers a road. Why? Because God was trying to demonstrate to Moses that this one you are not going to do because of what you have achieved by human means. This one you are not going to achieve because of your strength or the capacity of your flesh. This one you are not going to deliver because of your intelligence, qualification, weaponry, equipping and upbringing. If you are going to accomplish this task is going to be but by the grace of God. Let me preach just for one minute. The next season of your life is not going to be because you are intelligent. The next season of your life is not going to be because you are educated. The next season of your life is not because you know you, you know how to do makeup and you are beautiful. The next season of your life is because the grace of God is shining over your life and bringing you to a place that you do not qualify. Help me tell somebody God has a plan for my life. It is the moment where you need to make a transfer and come out of the place where you've been dependent on your labor and come to the place where you're now depending on his favor. Let, let me give you practical things that will help you migrate. God asks, what is that that is in your... Tell your neighbor what is in your hand. Tell the other neighbor for me what is in your hand. Whatever God is about to do in your life, he's going to do with something that you already have. Uh, some of you are trying to get a loan. I appreciate. God bless you with the loan. But he's going to do with something that you already have. When the woman with, uh, who lost her husband and the creditors wanted to pick her sons, the prophet did not say, uh, what is it that you don't have? He says, what do you have? And she said, I have nothing except a little oil. Listen to me. The miracle of God, the grace of God, the power of God is looking for what you already have and picking you up from where you are and I'm planting you into God's plan for your life. Help me tell your neighbor, what do you have? Help me tell the other neighbor, what do you have? 
God is about to shift and move somebody into a place where you only used to dream and imagine, but he's going to use something that you already have right now. His grace begins there. Moses, what do you have in your hand? And he says, a road. God says, oh, ho. so you've been thinking all this time that this is a road. Let me show you that when you put it in my presence, it can become a serpent. Cast it to the ground and it became a serpent. Literally, God helping me, I have preached. I think you have heard, so let's try and close. A hand has got five fingers. Oh, I, I, th I, thought, I, thought you would, I thought you would be shouting by now. I, I, th I really thought you would be shouting by now. So when God was asking Moses, what is that in your hand, not your hands? He was saying, have you noticed that I have placed grace because five fingers is the number of God's grace. Still looking for my church, still looking for my audience, still looking for who God sent me to preach to. What is that in? Because you have been seeing your hands as instruments of labor, but you should have been counting how many fingers you have, and you should have noticed that my grace is in your hands. Help me tell somebody, God has a plan for my life. Please shout it like you believe it. Say, God has a plan for my life. If you were playing the keyboard, now would be a good time to come to the keyboard. Really, now would be a good time. Notice with me. Moses answers what's in his five fingers. And he brings what is in his five fingers on the presence, in the presence of the Lord. And it becomes something. You've caught it. You've caught it. Do, do I need to remind you that we're in the month of May? Do I need to remind you that the month of May is the fifth month of the... Do I need to remind you that you've come into an arena of grace? There's still a few people that haven't caught it. Let's, let's see if we can help them. Let's see if we can help some people. When, please sit down. When God decided to deliver the children of Israel... Out of the grip of Pharaoh, the grip of labor, the grip where they worked a lot but produced the same result. The Bible says God performed ten plagues. You've got it, you've got it, you've got it. Plague number one, nothing shifted. Plague number two, nothing shifted. Plague number three, nothing shifted. Pharaoh still stuck to his guns. And he was still saying, I will not let God's people go. God had to perform 10 plagues. And if I had time, I would probably have gone through each one of them to try and show some significance of them. The last two being, number one, darkness and light. That's the ninth. The tenth one, the death of the firstborn. You've caught it. Are you all right? The last, the ninth one, it says Moses lifted up his hands and there was darkness in Egypt. But there was light in Goshen. In the same country. I like that eclipse. And they said that eclipse lasted for three days. And Jesus was in the tomb for... <sighs> Let's see if we can help some people quickly. If I'm preaching according to scripture, the death of the firstborn was the last plague that caused Pharaoh to call Moses and say, you and your people pack and go. Are you all right? And he said to Pharaoh, or Pharaoh said to Moses, I will never see your face again. And, I, and, and Moses agrees, says, you and I, we shall never see face to face. And that's the day that they left. Are you okay? They left when the firstborn of Egypt. Ah, yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his firstborn. <laughs> That he gave his only begotten son, his firstborn. He did not give his firstborn just for mathematics. He did not give his firstborn for statistics. He did not give his firstborn just for show. That in the same way a firstborn died and somebody moved from labor to grace, Jesus died so you could move from labor to grace. Aya, 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 aya. Somebody still hasn't caught the revelation. Let's see if we can help them. Jesus died because he was the firstborn of the father. 
Are you there? Just like every firstborn when they died in Egypt, it was a time for the people to be delivered from labor. The Bible says in that one day they went and asked for all the articles of silver and gold from every Egyptian and they were given to them. And the Bible records and they plundered Egypt in one night. In other words, what labor could not give them in 400 years? In one night, grace gave them. I really wish I knew who I came to talk to. God has a plan of grace for your life. It is a plan that your labor cannot deliver to you. I appreciate you are a hard worker. I appreciate you are good. I appreciate you are organized. But God sent me to announce to you that his plan for your life is not based on your labor. His plan for your life is based on his grace. Tell your neighbor God has a plan for my life. I feel like doing a dance on your behalf. Be- be- because if you knew what God is about to do for you, you are about to step into places that your labor cannot deliver for you. Only the grace of God can deliver. Tell your neighbor God has a plan for my life. Let me talk to somebody who has been feeling like you've been suffering. You've gone through the pain. You've gone through disappointment. Things have been unfair. I agree with you. They may have been unfair. But God is bringing you into a place of grace. He's bringing you into a place where your labor cannot be compared to the grace that is about to manifest over your life. Tell your neighbor, I'm ready for my grace. Help me tell the other neighbor, I'm ready for my grace. May this God manifest his grace over your life. May he cause his sun to shine over your life. Because you are a candidate of God's grace. You see, I have the audacity tonight to believe God for double grace. Now, 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 if you, if you have faith, you can believe God for just grace. But I have the audacity tonight to believe over your life, not just for grace. I am believing for double grace. Yeah, yeah, I know probably my faith has been drinking some Red Bull. We thank the Lord. But I just have this faith that whatever God wants to do, may God unleash a type of blessing over your life that comes with double grace. Somebody still wondering where I'm coming from. This is where I'm coming from. When God delivered the children of Israel from their place of labor, he performed 10 plagues. When now God was delivering Abraham, Abraham gave a tenth. You thought it was tithing when it was actually double grace that Abraham was saying I can give five but I want a tithe because the tithe says to me that I'm being delivered from the works of my double hands into a place of double grace some people still haven't caught the revelation let us help them you see you thought tithing is the church wanting your money You thought tithing is the pastor wanting to make himself rich. Listen to me. This God can supply the man of God without your help. He supplied Elijah in the wilderness with ravens. He supplied Jesus while he was still in a manger with wise men who gave him God, incense, and ma. God doesn't need you to supply his work. You need him to give you double grace. Let's work it for a few minutes. From today, do not see the tithe as a demand over your life. See the tithe as God's instrument to deliver the labor of your hands, your ten fingers, and bring you into a space of grace. Look at the tithe like the ten plagues of Egypt that are dealing with every pharaoh in your life. Dealing with every spirit that is trying to make you work for labor to produce at a higher capacity with the same result. Tithing is therefore an instrument of God that says you will gain what you will gain by the grace of God because those that do not tithe are those that produce everything they need in their lives through the label of their hands but bring the whole tithe bring it into my storehouse and test me on this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing that you will not have room to contend 
So tithing is not a demand. Tithing is the key to the grace of God. <laughs> to the double grace of God. Tithing is the deliverance that your life is not sustained by the labor of your hands. Your life is sustained by the grace of God. Stand up on your feet. Let's pray. Time is gone. Help me tell somebody, God has a plan for my life. Help me tell the other neighbor, God has a plan for my life. I'm going to be praying and we're going to be praying together in agreement. Our prayer is that whatever happened to the children of Israel must happen to you. No, you didn't hear me. Let me say it on one more time. The children of Israel, after 10 plagues, they moved from a land of labor to a land of supply. You know the story? That when they went into the wilderness, yes, it was a wilderness, but they woke up every morning to manna in the wilderness. They woke up every morning. The Bible says he led them by a pillar of fire by night and deserts are cold at night. And so God provided air conditioning system even at night. And deserts are hot during the day, but the Bible says, and he led them with a pillar of cloud during the day. The first air sea that was ever created was in the wilderness because this God moved his children from labor to favor. Listen to me, and I hope you hear me good. My assignment tonight is for a few individuals. You've been living in a place where now you are having to work harder. Now you are having to do more, yet to produce and meet the same amount of needs. I am praying that God brings you into the place of his grace where your life is not sustained by your labor. Your life, your needs are sustained by his grace. We are not disqualifying your labor, but we are saying you do not exist. You do not supply. You do not maintain your life. You do not minister to yourself on the standard of your labor. That your life is ministered at the standard of his grace. Are you here? Maybe before we pray, if you brought your tithe, you brought your giving, package it now so that we do what is right and bring it to the altar. Please help me with an envelope as well. If you brought your tithe, your offering, your giving, package it now so that before we pray, you put what you came to give to the Lord on the altar. I did not come to collect an offering. Please do not misinterpret me. If you feel this is manipulation, keep your money. Please, please keep it. Do not accuse me lest you say we made Abraham rich. Amen. But if you understand that you are in faith, package your giving and come and drop it at the altar now. Come and package it and drop it at the altar before we pray. Package it and drop it in Jesus' name. If you can begin to pray for your migration, if you can begin to pray for your deliverance, if you can begin to pray for your movement, moving from labor to grace, moving from flesh to spirit, migrating from Egypt to the promised land. Come on, begin to pray over your life now. Begin to migrate from your plan to the plan of God. Begin to move from the place where you are supplying your needs to the place where my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Go ahead, don't keep quiet. Begin to pray tonight. Begin to pray tonight. Begin to pray. Take, take it personal tonight. I said take it personal tonight. <laughs> Take your deliverance personal. Take your destiny personal. Move me, Lord. Move me, Lord. Move me, Lord. Move me. 